Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. We'll be starting in about one minute. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on enhancing NDCs looking at opportunities in the agriculture sector. I'm Katie Ross and I'm an associate with the Global Climate Program at the World, in World Resources Institute and it's a pleasure to welcome you today and I'll be also moderating today's discussion. We know that climate change directly and indirectly affects food production across the world and these impacts are expected to become increasingly more severe over the next several decades. So the focus of today's webinar is about scaling up efforts in the agriculture sector to support farmers in building resilience, in improving productivity, and in reducing emissions. And then subsequently how this translates into the NDC process. We know that many countries are in the midst of preparing their updated NDCs for submission to the UNFCCC. And we think that including agriculture in this next round of NDCs does offer all countries an opportunity to not only meet their Paris Agreement commitments, but also related sustainable development goals. Um, and we have a fantastic lineup of speakers today. I'm just going to run through the agenda briefly. We're going to start by hearing from Catalina Echeverry, who's from the Climate and Clean Air Coalition Secretariat, who's going to be talking about their work on advancing agricultural climate action. Laura Pagosh and I will then talk about a paper that WRI and Oxfam wrote together last year on opportunities to enhance NDCs by focusing on the agriculture sector. Laura will also talk about Oxfam's related work in Uganda and Mali. And then we'll have the pleasure to be joined by government representatives and learn from country experiences. Li Hong An from Vietnam's Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development will talk about integrating agriculture into Vietnam's NDC and climate change planning processes. We'll then hear from Walter Oyhantkatabal from Uruguay's Ministry of Livestock, Agriculture and Fisheries, who will speak about climate smart agriculture and how it's being implemented to benefit farmers in Uruguay and also help how this is going to help Uruguay meet its NDC target. Finally, we'll hear from Marshall Benu from the FAO about their work on NDCs in agriculture. Marshall is also joined by Cecilia Jones from Uruguay's Ministry of Livestock, Agriculture and Fisheries. Uh, so that's the presentation segment of uh, today's webinar. We'll then have time for questions and answers. Today's webinar is co-hosted by the World Resources Institute, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, Oxfam, the NDC Partnership, and UNDP. And a recording of today's webinar will also be made available after this meeting. And you can find that as well as a lot of other resources at wri.org forward slash step up 2020. Um, before I, we dive into the presentation segment, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Mary Levine, who's going to walk us through some of the logistics for today's webinar. Hi, good morning and thank you again um, for joining us. To best hear us, we suggest you use the computer, computer audio. However, if you experience any difficulties, you may select the telephone option and dial in with the appropriate number given in your webinar confirmation email. During the entirety of the webinar, attendees will be in listen mode only. Please feel free to use the Q&A box for any questions or comments you may have. It will be monitored throughout the webinar. Um, and you will see that function at the bottom of your screen. Today's presentation will be recorded and sent out via email approximately 24 hours following the webinar. Should you have any difficulties during the webinar or have any follow-up questions afterwards, please use the Q&A function or you may email me, Mary Levine, at mary.levine at wri.org. Thank you and have a good one. 
Thanks so much, Mary. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Catalina Cheveri. Catalina has been the coordinator of the Agriculture Initiative at the Climate and Clean Air Coalition since 2013. Her responsibilities include oversight of the achievement of the initiative's goals and targets, including providing support, advice, and monitoring for the implementation of activities in coordination with the lead partners. Catalina, thanks very much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, Katie, and greetings to all the participants that are with us today. Um, to begin with, I'd like to give all of the participants just a brief overview of about the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. Uh, we are a coalition, a voluntary partnership made up of over 120 partners, including governments, intergovernmental organizations, as well as members from the scientific community, businesses and uh, civil society organizations that are all committed to improving air quality and as well as protecting the climate by reducing short-lived climate pollutants. These pollutants include black carbon, hydrofluorocarbons, tropospheric ozone, and methane. Uh, since its launch in 2012, uh, country partners have increased from 12 um, that initiated from six, I'm sorry, that initiated uh, the, the coalition to 69 in 2020, demonstrating an increase in motivation at the national level to work on uh, short lived climate pollutants. Uh, the way we work is that we implement actions on the ground through um, high emitting sectoral initiatives that can help country understand what are some practical actions that can be taken now that can deliver quick results on reducing short lived climate pollutants. Um, as well, by taking action to reduce short lived climate pollutants, it's helping these countries meet some of their national um, benefits, as well as the multiple benefits that it can deliver, contributing to their ability to deliver on the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, and as well um, as increasing the, their ambition to meet the Paris Agreement goal to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. Our agriculture initiative work uh, focuses on reducing methane from the livestock sector. So it includes uh, enteric methane as well as uh, methane from manure. We also focus on reducing methane from paddy rice production. And uh, we're looking at black carbon through agricultural burning. And just more recently, we have started some work on supporting alternative sustainable uses of crop residue um, linked to bioenergy efforts. Our activities um, that include a value chain of uh, analysis of rice straw is focusing currently in India, um, linking it both to their energy security imperatives and, and also with efficient cooling. Um, our work is looking at what is what are some of the measures that are uh, possible to implement now, but we always keep in mind the main goal of ensuring food security as well as alleviating poverty. Uh, we're also helping to open more space for agricultural climate action, uh, helping and supporting countries to mobilize, um, to take action in a way that is compatible with, with their short and long-term goals, uh, taking into consideration food security, economic and poverty alleviation. And a key part of this work is mobilizing and engaging with key partners and complementary initiatives. Uh, to support countries on the ground in this work. We have strategic alliances with food and agriculture organization, CGIAR, uh, CCAFs, GRA, the World Bank, um, as well as WRI and Oxfam and the Global Methane Initiative. And really by combining these efforts, we're putting together a focus and linking um, uh, work on research and innovation policy and practice implementation, as well as provision of technical support and capacity building. Um, our agriculture initiative strategies focus is really to catalyze the policy and practice changes that are needed now and then to pass the mantle on to organizations such as Dow and World Bank that have a mandate to expand and scale up this work. Uh, we're doing this through building political will by a group of leaders in the field and raising awareness about the actions that can be taken now by assisting countries with tools and capacity building to identify increasingly ambitious actions, policies and targets, by supporting strengthened coordination at the national level and by marshalling 
evidence that enables large-scale financing to unlock the potential for scale up. On this slide, this um, shows an example of some of the uh, work we've done. It, it's really one of our prime examples of our work on methane through the livestock component. Um, this was a collaboration with FAO and with New Zealand through the NC Ag Research Centre and the Global Research Alliance, as well as with the World Bank and DEF. And in this project, um, it really helped in the first phase uh, countries in identifying some locally appropriate um, cost-effective technology packages or um, technology packages that could be implemented to reduce enteric methane emissions uh, from ruminant systems while also contributing to the country's short and long-term social and economic development um, and increasing the resilience to climate change. It helped countries then to build this robust data for their emissions inventory and also understanding the impact of these measures on um, productivity, uh, how to increase the efficiency of their production system and also the reproduction, um, I'm sorry, production and reproduction system. These measures were then mainstreamed into some large scale investment projects uh, by conducting direct work with the World Bank and Jeff in the design phase of, of these projects. And you'll hear more about Uruguay um, on that uh, link to their climate smart livestock production land restoration project with Bao and Jeff. We're also taking a, a practical approach where countries are willing to take action and enhance ambition by providing some quick funding um, for concrete actions. Maybe this is through feasibility studies or assessments that can help them enhance their NDCs or change policy. Um, leading toward reduction in SLCPs. An example is with Vietnam, where they submitted a request for assistance through our solution center to increase the potential for emissions reduction through their plan livestock emissions law, which relates to the implementation of their NDCs. Um, and, and here, you know, they were able to conduct some surveys about the measures that, that they were promoting uh, through household surveys as well at the farm level and also did some uh, cost analysis of these to understand what the ranking of these measures and what are the co-benefits um, linked to the, these. This helped them calculate GHG emissions, including methane emissions from each segment of livestock production, um, the reduction potential of these uh, practices, and to increase the scientific evidence-based selection of the options that would be included in the NDC. Finally, linking with other CCAC work, we're engaging at the national level so that governments can assess the potential for reductions in various sectors, including agriculture. And here we're providing support for agricultural institutional strengthening in um, Nigeria, where they have an SLCP action plan in place, including measures for the agriculture sector. And in Vietnam, uh, that work is soon to begin to help them increase the level of action that they're taking to reduce toward the climate pollutants in the sector um, and to enable the coordination, the interministerial coordination that is required. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to present. And if you have any questions, you can contact me directly at my email address. And you can also, um, we also invite you to visit our website and to uh, take a look at all of the information and resources that we have available. So thank you very much. Thank you, Catalina. That was a great overview of the CCAC's work and thanks for being a great partner to us all. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to talk about a paper that we wrote together with Oxfam last year with the support of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. And we had one very simple brief for this paper, and that was how to promote more ambitious and more directed inclusion of agriculture in this next round of NDCs. And I say directed quite deliberately here because it's about a thorough analysis of the opportunities that are available, along with the feasibility of implementation. Agriculture is actually fairly well represented in the first round of NDCs, one of the better, well, one of the better represented sectors. Uh, more than 90% of countries do reference agriculture in their first round of NDCs, both from a mitigation standpoint and an adaptation standpoint. Um, but it was oftentimes done in a fairly superficial way, limit, um, lacking a lot of detail, and sometimes countries did miss uh, synergies between mitigation and adaptation actions. 
so what I want to do is share three key messages from this work last year. And thanks, Mary, you've advanced the next slide. Um, the first is around the importance of including agriculture in this next round of NDCs. And firstly, it's about adaptation. Climate change is affecting how and where food is produced, and we know strength and adaptation will be needed, particularly in the low latitude regions, which are already facing significant declines in staples such as corn and wheat. It's also about people. Two and a half billion people around the world depend on agriculture for their livelihoods. So this is next round of NDCs is about choosing actions that can implement that can improve the lives and livelihoods of farmers and particularly those that are most vulnerable. Importantly, it's about reducing emissions. Agriculture contributes to 13% of global GHG emissions. That figure rises to nearly a quarter when you account for land use changes. So the agriculture sector does actually need to feed in quite strongly to most countries' climate change commitments. Um, as I touched on in my opening, when you're incorporating agriculture and climate commitments, it does offer countries an opportunity to bring their climate change agenda closer together with the sustainable development agenda, such as ending hunger and reducing poverty. And of course, NDCs are being increasingly used to attract finance. Um, an example of this is the NDC Partnerships Climate Action Enhancement Package, which was launched last year. It's a $15 million fund, which is being deployed to 65 countries to not only help accelerate their existing commitments under their NDC, but also set strength and targets as well. The second point from this paper is it's about embracing win-win solutions. And at the outset of the project last year, we spoke with a number of government officials and they emphasized the need to select actions that not only deliver mitigation benefits, but those that are good for adaptation and those that are good for farmers as well. And this really helps with getting support for buy-in, support for implementation, because indeed in many cases, um, the ministries of climate are not going to be the ones that are gonna be implementing these actions. So that support is really needed. Um, we looked across a range of studies, uh, including a six year research project that WRI led on creating a sustainable food future. And we selected 15 measures that are generally good for reducing emissions, they're generally good for farmers, and they're generally good for improving resilience. And um, the paper lays these out in a lot more detail, but they're generally classified into four main categories, uh, as shown on the screen. Uh, it's about better livestock management, it's about better crop management, it's about broader land management strategies, including the reduce of fire in the agriculture sector, improving soil and water for, for, um, fertility, improving agroecological approaches. And then the final element is about more sustainable production and consumption measures, such as shifts to healthy and more sustainable diets and reducing food loss and waste across the supply chain. Um, interestingly, this more sustainable production consumption measures wasn't touched on that strongly in the first round of NDCs. Uh, only a dozen countries did include food loss and waste targets, and we've not seen a single country um, talk about changes in diet either in their NDCs. The final point that I wanted to make um, from our work is that enhancing NDCs can take on a variety of forms. Uh, most countries are moving toward economy-wide emission reduction targets and then subsequently strengthening those targets. But uh, for those countries that are not in a position to strengthen an economy-wide target, there are other opportunities to include agriculture in an enhanced NDC. And this uh, screen lays out a few of those options. Um, Strengthened implementation measures are always important to ensure that the NDC is successful. So the NDC could describe um, strengthened governance arrangements, more inclusive processes, um, better ways to channel finance toward agriculture. Um, there's also opportunity to add more detail about specific policies and actions that a country will pursue in the agriculture sector to meet its climate goals. Um, I laid a few of those out earlier. Um, an important message is that it's not 
just adding actions for the sake of adding actions. Um, most countries' agriculture sectors are very diverse, so the actions that are selected will depend on the climate impacts that are being faced, the type of crops that are being produced, and, and importantly, the type of farmer. What you're suggesting for a large-scale agriculture producer might be quite different from what you propose um, for a small-scale farm that has less than two hectares. Um, the paper does lay out these uh, actions in a lot more detail. Uh, if you are interested in finding out more, you can find the paper online. Um, and I'd also be happy to answer any questions you might have in the Q&A portion. Uh, Laurel uh, is a co-author on this paper and she's also gonna touch on some other elements of the paper. And I'm going to hand over to her now. Um, just firstly, by, by way of introduction, um, Laurel Pagosh is an Associate Policy Advisor for Climate Change and Energy at Oxfam America. Uh, Laurel focuses on policy around short-lived climate pollutants like methane and black carbon and also NDC enhancement. Laurel, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm going to pass over to you now. Great, thanks so much, Katie. Um, and hi, everyone. Uh, just quickly for those who may be unfamiliar with Oxfam, we're an international NGO focused on tackling the injustices of poverty with climate change being one of those drivers. So today I'll be highlighting from our paper, Foundations for Action, and a few case studies uh, showing how NDCs can be an important lever to foster productive, uh, resilient farming practices while keeping the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. So in the paper, we uh, list out strategies countries can take, as Katie mentioned, both adaptation and mitigation measures, essentially the what. And with this framing, we can refer to foundations for action as the how. And getting this right is really essential for actions to be inclusive, equitable, and provide the opportunity to be scaled. So first, as you see, uh, is scoping the national agriculture sector. This scoping includes production and consumption trends of livestock and crops and who producers are from smallholders to large scale farmers and anticipating impacts of a changing climate. There's also an immense variety of land ownership and management systems across the world. So avoiding a one size fits all approach uh, is most important here. Um, now, uh, over two and a half billion people uh, worldwide depend on agriculture for their livelihoods, as we've heard, and the active inclusion of these stakeholders can significantly strengthen and quality the durability of an NDC. Uh, especially bringing in diverse voices like indigenous peoples and women's groups is also important and multi-stakeholder groups that are self-selected especially can both ensure buy-in and improve the implementation of the NDC. Um, next, the policies that are aligned and coordinated across ministries, especially when it comes to agriculture and climate, allow for opportunities and, and synergies to emerge. Um, so this ranges from existing economic and development plans, sustainable development goals, national adaptation plans or NAPs, and long-term climate action plans, which work in tandem and reduce capacity restraints, reduce duplication, and can also reduce costs. So I just mentioned capacity, and in the first round of NDCs, a lot of countries flagged monitoring, reporting, and verification systems as a challenge in the agriculture sector. And each country is at a different point in strengthening these systems uh, to base climate targets off of. But if possible, these with a robust modeling and analysis uh, can help to facilitate clear and transparent understanding of why and, cert and how uh, certain targets were developed. And they also can be used as a communication tool for motivating climate action. But this raises the importance of identifying opportunities for support. And by support, I mean international support uh, from the Green Climate Fund or Adaptation Fund, among others, uh, but also bilateral funds and private finance too. And domestic support plays a, a critical role 
uh, coming in the form of extension services for farmers, uh, redirecting agriculture subsidies to more climate resilient production, and improved forecasting of weather and climate impacts. And identifying the gaps and opportunities for support at the outset can also maximize impact and reduce risks and uh, help to streamline access to finance down the road. Now, um, the final foundational piece here is enabling equitable and inclusive governance. And this means building a rights-based approach from the start. The three main issues that can increase opportunities and risk uh, and uh, reduce vulnerabilities to of agriculture communities um, include gender equality, secure land tenure uh, sensitive to customary rights, and upholding so social safeguards and rights of small health, small scale farmers. Uh, so to demonstrate um, how important these elements and all of these foundational pieces are, I'd like to highlight uh, some case studies. And these case studies uh, show how supporting farmers means not only investing, investing in mitigation and adaptation projects, but also addressing the systemic barriers uh, that enable farmers to develop more sustainable agriculture practices. So in this first example, uh, it's worth noting that Mali produces only 0.06% of global greenhouse gas emissions, but agriculture and agricultural land use are the country's main emitting sectors. Uh, the agriculture sector also employs about 85% of Mali's workforce, so it's no wonder uh, that there's a particular emphasis on agriculture here, uh, especially highlighting adaptation and increased resilience of female farmers in the NDC. Uh, so Oxfam launched uh, Savings, Saving for Change uh, in Mali in 2005. Uh, it's a community-based program that trains groups of mostly women in rural villages to save regularly, borrow from their group's fund, and repay loans with interest. Um, so these groups have evolved uh, over time and now are providing training uh, in business and entrepreneurial skills and include agroforestry techniques as well. So trees planted uh, by these groups uh, provide live fencing to protect gardens, uh, firewood, and particular species have also improved soil quality and improved water retention, um, and a range of other benefits that you can see uh, listed here. But agroforestry, especially when native trees are, are planted, uh, can help increase climate resiliency and provide additional income streams, which in turn can support livelihoods through improved food security, nutrition, and health outcomes. Uh, now there are barriers to effective agroforestry uh, beyond the challenges of a changing climate, including a need for recognition of community tenure rights to plant. So I wanted to share for the Saving for Change uh, evaluation that we did here in Mali uh, with several findings regarding uh, these barriers. So 10 years after the initial program, uh, evaluators found that 85% of groups continued to function independently, and also group members reported an increased role in decision making uh, within the household. And that emergency assistance uh, through the savings and loans from the group also helped them ensure food security during rough times. And although women's empowerment is also highly constrained within the bounds of rural Malian society, Saving for Change groups also allowed women to petition for rights that they would normally be refused as individuals. And the most significant of these being land ownership, uh, which was permitted for collective production. So the dual strengths of this program have really shown to be both environmental and social. And Women Uniting has proven to be powerful in developing social capital, social change, and reducing vulnerability and food security. So to move to the next uh, example here, uh, in Uganda, uh, also just to mention the situation here, uh, over 80% of the country's emissions come from forest degradation, animal waste, and conversion of forest to cropland. Now through its NDC, Uganda aims to reduce these emissions and increase climate resilience across sectors and develop early warning systems and a robust monitoring system. Uh, just as mentioned earlier, involving community stakeholders, self-selected from the local and regional level, 
at the outset of planning is pivotal uh, to ensure buy-in and incorporate diverse perspectives, needs, and priorities. So concerns were raised from civil society that the first round of NDCs that were submitted um, weren't consultative enough to include grassroots farmer voices. So a project was designed uh, to influence government policies on climate change and agriculture to ensure civil society was included in the national roadmap and establish accountability in aligning NDCs to uh, the country's national adaptation plan or NAP um, and also other national policies and programs that were tied to the sector budget and those decisions. Um, and the government has made dedicated efforts to make its NDCs and development plans and other national programs aligned and cohesive. So there have been several convenings uh, since the NDC was set in 2015. Um, too many to discuss here, but last year, a roundtable discussion with the Climate Change Department uh, con consulted with civil society on programming and implementation of the NDC. Um, the ministry pledged to invite grassroots consultations for the NDC review process this year in 2020. So the work is ongoing and um, but really essential to establishing accurate plans uh, that reflect community priorities and needs including extension services uh, funding needs and and other support uh, so this influencing has also helped grassroots groups coordinate and advocate in networks and be more involved uh, in civic age engagement as well so uh, with that i hope that you know these cases give you an idea of some of the opportunities uh, for both adaptation and mitigation action, and uh, also those that support farmers and address the systemic barriers that they face and can be included in enhanced NDCs. Thank you, and back to you, Katie. Thanks so much, Laurel, and it's fantastic to hear about the work that's going on in Uganda and Mali. Appreciate you giving us that overview. Um, we have an active chat discussion already ongoing, so if you do have any questions for the panelists as they go, please do post them in the Q&A box and we'll also do our best to answer them as we go and then there'll be some time for discussion at the end of the webinar as well. Um, it's my pleasure to now introduce our next speaker, Le Hong An. Hong An is a senior officer and Ag NDC focal point at Vietnam's Department of Science and Technology, oh, sorry, of Department of Science, Technology and Environment at the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. Thank you very much for joining us. The floor is yours. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Hoang An. So I start to sharing my screen. So I want to switch up my uh, video to make my connection is more stable. How can I do that? Uh, just the at the bottom, Hung An, uh, where you'll select okay. stop video. Perfect. Thank you. So first of all, I would like to thank you, the organizer, CCAC, WRI, the Oxfam, UNDP, and NDC Partnership for your organizing this very interesting uh, event. Thanks to the college who are spending your time to attending this webinar. So as the given topic for today's discussion is the NDC enhancement opportunities for agriculture. And I'm invited to present with you the process of enhancing agriculture NDC of Vietnam to include strengthened action including short-lived climate pollutant commit commitment on reducing the GHG emission. So why agriculture? Why the food system? So according to the scientific research, agriculture activities are source of emission, mainly is methane and black carbon as in the presentation of the Catalina. So, but it also have potential to do with the mitigation. Moreover, the sector in Vietnam has important role in the social economy context. 
So I hope that you may heard about the Vietnam rice ATMs provide free rice for people out of work amid coronavirus crisis. In some cases, money doesn't work, but food can help people survival. So in this slide, showing you how much GHG emission from agriculture in Vietnam contributing to the, the total source of the country. This number is uh, from the Biennium updated report number two of Vietnam since uh, 2017. So agriculture occupied for almost 30% of the country's GHG emission. It is the second large after the energy. You can see this. And of which rice cultivation is almost about 50%. Is this, and the second source is livestock management, mainly uh, come from the enteric fermentation of uh, ruminant and livestock management. Our sector also responsible for land use, land use chain forestry, but it is separated in other chart, so I did not show it here. Next slide. So moving to the climate change policy and NDC in the national context. As you see that we build up the national adaptation plan in agriculture sector. We call it NAPAC as the center of the climate change action plan and the plan for implementation of Paris Agreement. So we also are very active in develop the national um, determined contribution. And then um, this, uh, we included all adaptation and mitigation aspect. Um, at the moment, we are uh, in the process of reviewing and updating the NDC. So with this process, we more focus also in adaptation, mitigation, especially core benefit between adaptation and mitigation. We also uh, review and focus on disaster risk reduction and loss and damage. And then all of these climate change issues are mainstreaming into strategic development orientation of agriculture and rural development sector for the periods of 2021 to 2013 and vision to 2045. Because you know that all, all the, um, the strategy of the sector in country are end of 2020. So we are now very in recent time to prepare for the next uh, strategy. And in this uh, slide, you can see how agriculture sectors NDC measures priority, prioritization and selection. In the left hand side, you will see the three different steps of the review and updated. We're starting from policy review and then we identify the action for prioritization and selection, and then we do the potential impact assessment. In the left, in the right hand side, is the very detail of each step. With the policy review, we focus on policies of course, and institutional arrangements to do the NDC commitment with the focus on international commitment of the country. And then when we identify these, um, the option, we focus on mainly as a, a criteria as the option must be cost effectiveness. We use some model to calculate like a marker cost benefit analysis. And the option must be scalability or easy to scaling up. One of the very important criteria for re review and update is a core benefit and economically feasible of the option. So in agriculture sector, very luckily that we could find some of the action as the adaptation action, but could also achieve the mitigation of the GHG emission, vice versa. And then we think that the action selected 
must be able to do the MRV or for, for mitigation or MNE for adaptation. And last but not least is technical soundness, which is very important for the farmer. And then uh, impact assessment, we focus on economic impacts, social impacts, including food security, gender, vulnerable, and then environmental issue. So with this uh, process, we will identify the list of the NDC's measures or actions of, of the agriculture sector being included in the country NDC updated. Uh, this slide is just showing you how the global and national process are matching by putting some milestone here. Uh, here is a 2015, we ratify the Paris Agreement and uh, we uh, submit the INDC. And then in 2016 in Vietnam, we uh, updated the Climate Change Action Plan for the periods of five years up to 2020. And then 2013, uh, 17, we uh, revive, first we do the first revive our NDC to make a implementation plan for the agriculture sector. And then this year, we are very much uh, happy to share with you that the, the ministry already um, approved our plan to implement Paris Agreement. And then we uh, hurry up to finish to complete the update of the Climate Change Action Plan uh, of the next 10 years, and then mainstreaming it to the, the sector uh, strategy. So as to how the national and global are matching in the process, and after um, doing the reviewing and updated, there are some proposal that's uh, you could see in the table, we group in the six uh, main GHG uh, mitigation measure group. The first is the water management and methods for paddy rice cultivation. And in the right hand side, you will see the detailed example of the specific measure for this group is uh, including alternative wetting and drying methods, um, sustainable. Um, intensification, um, SRI, sustainable rice intensification, and some other name of the Vietnamese option like a one mass five reduction or three gain three reduction, which is the very uh, strong adopted by the farmer, especially in southern part of Vietnam in Mekong Delta. Also, we do the changing rice crop patterns to avoid the flooding or other um, um, adverse uh, impact by climate change, also nitrogen fertilizer application. For the second group, we focus on uh, the crops other than paddy rice. Also for detail is uh, water saving irrigation and intercropping as a specific measure. And then um, dealing with the uh, agriculture uh, residual and um, uh, we have the uh, third group is a uh, manage, recycle, and reuse crop residuals and byproducts. Uh, focus on reuse the rice or coffee husks, or no burning savannas, straw recycling to, to do the mushroom, to do the biochar production, or something like this. And um, we uh, focus on livestock uh, management. A um, uh, big part is the um, manual management by doing biogas composting, producing the organic fertilizer, and also very big room for changing feeds, controlling ruminant fermentation, missing animal feed by increasing the digestive process or balance. Uh, uh, nature uh, and in in and other uh, in the fish mix. 
uh, as I said at the beginning, we also responsible for land use, land use chain forestry. We focus on REST plus, uh, agroforestry, long-term rotation, plantation, etc. So this is a way how we could um, develop it and then we ca can uh, easily to find the core benefit of the option within the group. So we are highlight uh, for the option which is have a last core benefit. Also, um, we uh, do analysis for the option that it could be um, have a very strong com uh, competent uh, for natural resource. And we try to identify the solution to show the problem. So and in my last slide, not really a conclusion, but the, just a, some uh, recommendation that the results provided from the technical uh, assistance support project, like uh, from the CCIC, uh, from the FAO, UNDP, GIZ, uh, for example, are very helpful for the country for our in terms of providing the scientific space for selecting the feasible mitigation option of agriculture sector being included in the NDC of Vietnam. We hope that we could finish it soon in the middle of the year and then we will submit it before the COP. Uh, yeah. So the consistency in selecting priorities across different planning framework and policy initiative in order to make informed decision to include the most uh, cost effective, with the high co benefit, economically feasible and technical sound mitigation measure in NDC. Uh, other as a stakeholder involvement and coordination at all level are very important, especially farmer and private sector the government uh, to make the commitment but the government itself cannot do if we can cannot involve the strong support from the farmer private sector and we think that the resource mobilization and cooperation domestically and interna internationally are very crucial in implementing and achieving mitigation targets so in our NDC, we uh, set two different levels of targets. By our effort, national effort, we could try to reduce 8% of the uh, total GT emission as business as with the compare with the business as usual. But with the international support, we could increase the targets uh, at the INDC is 25 percent but um, in the process of reviewing and updating NDC we may uh, see the potential to increase the the targets up to about uh, 27 percent or something so I think that is the end of my presentation thank you for your attention and of course you may have some question thank you very much fantastic Hang on. thank you so much for that very helpful overview and i really enjoyed learning about the process of selecting your agriculture actions that will be included in the ndc and best of luck for for the update process i did see you have a number of questions in the q a box um, so we'll try and get into those later or if you can type in responses now that will be fantastic um, it's my pleasure now to turn over to walter oyhantkdwell Walter is from Uruguay's Ministry of Livestock, Agriculture and Fisheries, and he's going to be speaking about climate smart livestock management practices that are being implemented in Uruguay. Walter, thank you very much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for the invitation to participate in this very interesting webinar. Um, I, I am sharing my screen. I hope everybody can see it now. Looks great. And, yeah, and, and I hope you can listen to me well. Uh, 
Well, um, I, I will first start by saying that uh, Uruguay is a livestock country and our economy is strongly based in the agricultural sector. We export 70% of the meat we produce. And these characteristics of being a, a rangelands country with a high uh, number of heads of, of cattle results in important emissions of methane and N2O from the livestock sector. So when we designed our first NDC, we, uh, we thought that it was not possible to ignore the importance of uh, meat production in, in our inventory. Uh, and in, so we decided to include the specific and explicit targets <clears throat> for the beef sector in terms of emissions intensity. This concept of emissions intensity is key for us in our mitigation strategy because we consider that uh, we, we cannot uh, reduce absolute emissions uh, compromising food production. We need to produce more with less emissions and uh, having uh, quite a strong or, or accurate uh, estimation of the evolution of, of our emissions through our national GAG inventories, we could project <coughs> and adopt uh, targets uh, in terms of emissions intensity. And <coughs> as you see, we have an important uh, opportunity or important potential to, re to produce uh, less carbon in intense uh, beef uh, per kilo uh, produce. So these are, are, are our targets. In, in the beef sector and are one of the main targets of our NDC. And it's, it's not the only target we have in agriculture. We have other eight targets, including agriculture and including also uh, LULUCF activities. So uh, our uh, NDC in, in agriculture is, is quite ambitious, I, I would say. <clears throat> and if we look at um, the structure of the emissions in, in our inventory, well, 75% of all our emissions come from, the, from agriculture. So in the list of, <clears throat> of countries that uh, <clears throat> the WRI uh, uh, illustrates on, uh, which are the countries that have more percentage of emissions from agriculture, Uruguay is in the eighth position. Uh, so we are am among the countries with higher uh, uh, percentage of emissions coming from agriculture, and in particular, the enteric fermentation, as you can see in this slide, is uh, the most important, followed by N2O from manure deposited on pastures. Uh, here you can see the information of the National GH Inventory, which is for us the main MRV tool to, to, to see uh, the trends that, and how we can influence uh, the, 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 the emissions of methane and N2O in agriculture. One of the, of the main uh, elements that uh, our country has uh, and is very useful to, to set targets and to implement the MRV is that we have a national system of livestock uh, information and we have 100% traceability of cattle with electronic and visual tags. Uh, so this has the benefit of providing us with a high quality and updated activity data, which is absolutely relevant for the continuous and annual monitoring of uh, the, the performance of, of the sector in terms of emissions. So this is one key aspect that we have a strong activity data uh, databases. Um, and we also have elect electronic sort declarations by all farmers, not only in terms of number of heads, but also in terms of land use. Uh, then this uh, opens us the possibility to, to estimate the, the emission factors the country specific emission factors in terms of the quality of, of the diet and we can do it in, in, in dynamic terms. So in every inventory 
we can re, uh, re calculate the emission factors based on the changes in the average diet of the animals. Um, this issue of uh, developing country specific uh, methods is one of the most relevant for the MRV uh, of, of the NDC targets. Uh, if we use tier one default methods in our inventory, we are not able to capture uh, the progress or the dynamic of, of this uh, sectoral emissions. So having uh, tier two methods is key or even tier three, but uh, static tier two methods are, not, are also not able to capture the, the dynamics of the technical change uh, at, at sector level. So uh, the, there is a need to, to update the, the tier two emission factors uh, through time. Uh, but to, to have tier two uh, emission factors, we need to know several uh, parameters. We need to have digestibility information, we have to know the pregnancy rates. We have to know the live weight, the weight gain. So there are several parameters that are key in order to build a tier two and a tier two that is dynamic. So as I said before, our strategy is to reduce emissions intensity through improved production efficiency and productivity in beef production systems. And also including sequestration of carbon in soils and biomass in trees where possible. So as, as you see, it's very simple. We, we have emissions intensity is, uh, is the result of the emissions divided by the quantity. If we increase the quantity that we produce without increasing the emissions, then we are reducing the emissions intensity and our beef is cleaner and cleaner with time. Um, but uh, in order to consider also the removals, the potential for removals and, and move forward in the direction of net emissions or net emissions intensity, we need to assess also uh, what, what happens with soil organic carbon uh, uh, in the grasslands and also to assess the impact of introducing more trees in zero pastoral systems or trees for providing shadow and shelter. So this, uh, this is a way in which we are thinking that we cannot think only on emissions, but we have to consider altogether the follow emissions and removals that we have in, in at landscape level. Uh, in some moment in time, some years ago, we, we understood that, that we needed to implement uh, at field level uh, a, 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 a series of, of pilot uh, project in which we could uh, calibrate models, validate the impact of different technologies. And for this, we designed a project. This project, the name of the project is Climate Smart Livestock Production and Land Restoration in the Uruguayan Rangelands. And it's a platform for learning and validating in order to, to, to feed the upscaling process at national level. This project is financed by Jeff, partially, and national resources also. It, it is a, an important role of the CCAC, the CCAC uh, co-funding this project in the methane uh, assessment component of the project, and is technically assisted by the FAO. Uh, the, the, the project intends to mitigate climate change and restore the degraded lands, but also to evaluate the economical, social, and environmental impacts and the barriers of the alternative management in order to scale up the proposal to uh, the national level. Uh, we are starting uh, last year, so we are already working with 60 farms in some 35,000 hectares of direct project intervention. And there we are not only uh, co-innovating with the farmers, but also doing a careful protocol of monitoring of the different variables and parameters that are key to assess the social, the economic, and the environmental performance of the proposal. Uh, the project has three components. One first component is to strengthen the institutional framework 
and the national capacities to implement the Climate Smart Livestock Management Strategy. Uh, one of the outputs that we expect from this process is to prepare our NAMA and to, uh, to uh, develop our MRV system for the, the results of the, of the NAMA application. And we are going to improve further the, the accuracy of the estimates of the GAG emissions intensity and soil carbon sequestration, and in particularly in the, in the methane uh, mitigation component, we have a, a relevant support from the CAC. Um, the second component of the project is at field level. As I told you before, we are working with short, with small and medium uh, farmers, 60 farms. We are including very explicitly the gender perspective and the implementing the on-farm on monitoring system to monitor GHG emissions, adaptation strategies, financing, land degradation, and biodiversity. Finally, the third component of the project is the monitoring, evaluation, and knowledge sharing component, which is already very relevant. We will prepare manuals and media products for improved climate smart livestock measures and technologies for the use of extension workers and producers. We will monitor and evaluate the adaptation uh, impact of the proposals. We will share knowledge with other countries and disseminate data and tested methodology. And we will have a communication strategy implemented. So uh, uh, this is a, a co-benefit project. And in, in this regard, it's very similar to what we heard from the colleague from Vietnam. Yeah, when we think of agriculture, we can not only uh, consider mitigation, we shall consider what is the impact of what we're doing in productivity, in the income for the family of the farmer, uh, and this income should be higher and more stable, so the proposal is sustainable in time. We aim to reduce GHG emissions intensity, we aim to increase carbon sequestration in soil, and biomass of trees for shadow and shelter or silvopastoral systems. We expect to have positive effects on biodiversity because one of the main uh, technologies to apply is to, uh, to uh, adequate the grazing pressure. Uh, and uh, the current situation in Uruguay is that uh, grazing pressure is too high and there is overgrazing which degrades uh, soils and biodiversity. And by adjusting the stocking rate and the raising pressure, we expect we will recover biodiversity. And recovering biodiversity will mean more resilience in the system. And we expect to have technologies that are successfully demonstrated, deployed, and transferred to feed the upscaling process. And finally, an enabled policy environment and mechanisms created for technology transfer. Um, these are one of the uh, main practices that we are uh, promoting in, in, in involving the farmers, uh, which is basically to increase the forage allowance, allowance for the, for, the, for the animals, to intercede pastures with grass and legumes, to sown grass legume mixtures and annual for the crops, and strategic feeding and supplementation which means, for example, winter and summer supplementation, dietary flushing, control of breeding, and also genetics. Finally, uh, I would like to share with you what I consider that are some key, key messages to uh, enhance the, the role of agriculture in the NDCs in the future. First, we consider that it's very relevant to have a co-benefit approach or a win-win approach, as also Katie has mentioned, because these are the approaches that are the most promising for, for, the, for the sector. We can not only look at mitigation or, or, or only at adaptation, but we have to, to look at the system as a whole and, and, and see uh, the, the, the co-benefits in terms of social and economic impacts for the, for the farmers, in particular for small and medium farmers. Second message is that it is key to have a strong MRV system and M and E system for uh, mitigation and, and adaptation respectively. And for this, the, the, the GHG inventory is, is a key piece uh, uh, of the tools uh, uh, 
that we have to use for the for the DMRV. So to improve the activity data is key to develop a tier two emission factors that are dynamic and that capture technical change is irre absolutely relevant. But we also, and third message is that national research uh, is absolutely relevant and because we cannot just uh, apply directly what uh, in other contexts has been successful, but we need to, to develop our uh, uh, country specific or regional technologies and validate them. We also need to involve farmers and farmers organization, and we need to, to strengthen our national extension systems in order to, uh, to uh, make it possible to, to change the paradigm that in, uh, in the, the way which farmers are managing the animals and the grasslands, we need a, a very relevant role of the extension ser uh, services. Uh, another message that is important is that we are in a learning by doing process. All countries are in this process of learning by doing. So sharing experiences, sharing uh, case studies, uh, success stories, or even failures is very relevant. So platforms uh, as this one, uh, as, the, uh, as the NDC uh, platform, the Global Research Alliance, the CAC, CCAC, are all very relevant because if we learn together, we are going to learn faster. And so um, this is absolutely key to, to, to be in contact and to share information, experiences, data, uh, and work together with the international institutions and the international organizations. Another element which, which I, uh, similar to Vietnam, consider that is very relevant is the access to means of implementation. If resources are not mobilized, to developing countries, it is really difficult to make more ambitious uh, targets for agriculture. Uh, so this is absolutely relevant. It is one of the key points that we are discussing on the Coronavia Joint Work in Agriculture uh, under the UNFCCC. Uh, and finally, that uh, it's also, uh, yes, it is very important to consider the agriculture in, in the NDCs, but uh, we should see agriculture together with the LULUCF opportunities. O sea, to see, I mean, to see emissions and also removals. So a landscape approach and, and, and a follow approach from the national perspective in which we consider uh, all together the opportunities for uh, increasing uh, removals and reducing emissions is a, a more comprehensive and more promising approach in, in our view. So this is a, in very short uh, and brief words what uh, I wanted to share with you about how are we working uh, in agriculture and NDCs in Uruguay. Uh, we are not going to update our NDC because it has been already very explicit and, and uh, ambitious till 2025. But in 2023, we will be uh, finishing the preparation of our second NDC, 25, 2030. So we have the challenge of, uh, to assess what we could achieve in the first NDC. And for that, we have an annual uh, public MRV uh, a system that is already online and open for the public, but we will also have to discuss what are the new targets that we can incorporate um, from this perspective uh, to, to be very connected in, in this type of networks is very relevant to, to discover new entry points or to discover new opportunities and new possibilities to do better. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, of course I open or some questions that may be raised later by the, by the audience. Thank you very much. Also, I can't thank you enough. Um, those are very, very important messages that you just underscored and I'm glad we're gonna be making a recording available 
from this event so people can watch it again. You've also underscored a lot of messages coming out of other countries too. And I particularly liked what you said, when we, we learn together, we, we learn faster. So thank you very much for that. Um, it's now my pleasure to turn over to the final presenters for today's webinar. Um, we have Marshall Benu from the Food and Agriculture Organization and Cecilia Jones from the Ministry of Livestock um, agriculture and Fisheries um, at Uruguay, from Uruguay as well. Just by way of introduction, Marshall is the FAO Natural Resources Officer in the Climate and Environment Division. He's in charge of the Mitigation of Climate Change and Agriculture Program and the FAO Lead Technical Officer for the thematic working group on agriculture, food security, land use under the umbrella of the NDC Partnership. So a wealth of experience. Uh, welcome Marshall and Cecilia. Okay, you can hear me? Yes, we can, and we can see your slides. Okay, and I will start my video so you can see, see me also. Okay, so thank you to all for attending this webinar. That is really, really important for, for SFAO, because as you know, FAO is really focusing on food security and agriculture. Uh, so this presentation, I will, I will be brief after we'll have access to all the slides and the, the link uh, that are provided on the different slides. And uh, Cecilia will end the presentation with a concrete uh, example of, uh, of support of FAO to, to country. So just to, to start, uh, first, first, uh, okay. All the work we are doing on climate change and on, uh, on uh, agriculture is all part of the uh, uh, biggest uh, strategy we have. So we have adopted the uh, FAO strategy into, uh, now in 2017. And so it's part of a corporate approach. And here you have really the summary of what we are doing. We are working toward uh, adapting smallholder production and making the livelihood of rural population more resilient. So this is really what we want to achieve all this to tackle the food uh, insecurity in the world. So we are engaged working with, uh, with different partners and with uh, our, our country member. So my presentation will be really uh, a, a snapshot. First analysis from global to regional an analysis. Then I will present briefly what we are doing, having uh, countries exchanging and sharing their experience. TWG, I will explain what it is. And uh, we will uh, go uh, straight forward into uh, country support, some categories of country support, and uh, we will end with an example. So just briefly, in terms of uh, of we are doing, to, to understand, first we, we, we had to understand the situation. Um, uh, so we were trying to, to, to really better shape or support the country to understand where we are, where we are in terms um, of uh, agriculture and NDC, where agriculture is in the NDC, how it is represented. So we first uh, did some global uh, stock take, uh, trying to understand and realize that uh, it was not a surprise that uh, agriculture is really important uh, sector when it's uh, on uh, adaptation, but also in, in mitigation for, for, for most countries. And then we move to, toward regional analysis where behind uh, just the global uh, analysis, we were looking at of gap on opportunities because as you know, NDCs have to be uh, enhanced regularly. And so we were looking if the first round of uh, INDC intended or NDC, first round of NDC, were really tackling uh, the 100% of the, the opportunities. And so we are doing this at a regional level. Uh, here you have some example. Uh, we started with Eastern Africa, then we moved to Southern Europe and uh, Central Asia. And we are now this year we will publish Latin America, the Caribbean region, Asia and the Pacific Island. And this year we are engaging to finalize for the all Africa on the Near East and North Africa region. Um, and then there's a lesson learned that uh, we had to develop the first analysis, in fact, uh, took us more than one year because we realized that we had to develop a really a full methodology to understand where agriculture is in the NDC. As there is no one uh, single uh, format for all NDC, and uh, basically every document is a standalone document with its own methodology, its own uh, template, we had to understand how to categorize the different action, both in terms of uh, mitigation, adaptation, or e eventually 
for co-benefits. So we developed some two methodology you have here, you have the link, and also one focusing on SDG to clearly understand uh, where is the link with the agenda 2030 agenda and how to show how when you have an action on, on uh, agriculture that is also supporting country to achieve their different uh, SDGs. So moving on the second point briefly, so the thematic working group, the TWG, it, it is uh, this uh, thematic working group was set, uh, was set under the umbrella of the NDC partnership that was explained a little bit uh, before. And this is the first on so far only working group on agriculture, food security and land use. We have two, two co-chairs, you have seen uh, Walter, Walter Jan Sabat, that is one of the chairs from Uruguay. And we have uh, Australia, Stephen Turnbull from Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We have uh, an annual meeting. It's open to all uh, countries that are members of the NDC partnership and, and beyond. And also to not only country, but also international organization, bilateral organization or institution. And we have, uh, so it's a group of exchange. Uh, it's supported by, by the Federal Ministry of uh, Economic Cooperation of Germany. And so far we have 40 uh, member country plus European Union, so 27, 28 members, it depends when we are counting. And some member institutions, a uh, UN system with IFA, for instance, international organization like the World Bank uh, and other institutions uh, like CCSC, for instance. So what we're doing, so here you have a snapshot. Uh, we are engaged in e-discussion on this is good uh, <laughs> nowadays with uh, being stuck at home. Uh, it's really a, a good way to, to, to exchange. So we have a, a, a D-group. And there was a forum and there was some question where a member uh, or countries or members of the NDC uh, of the TWG can exchange. We're organizing online learning events, which are similar to this webinar, but on a focal, uh, focalizing on the agenda that was set by the country. So this year we will have uh, one on uh, fire or emission on gender, for instance. We are doing peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, uh, trying to also inform on the international agenda, for instance, here you have the Corniga Joint Work on Agriculture, that is uh, the um, a stream work of a negotiation under the, the UNFCCC, the Climate Change Convention. So we're trying to inform and to, to, to create the link or that political uh, agenda that the highest level of the convention can support uh, NDC or on the thematic working group. And we're also organizing joint events. So here on the side, you have three joint events that was organized at the last uh, COP uh, la last year in, in December. So one on a side event on wildfire, on NDC implementation of the one on water, the importance of water as a resource is to be managed uh, in agriculture, mostly for dry land region. And there was a one specifically on a more regional scope on Latin America and Caribbean to identify uh, gaps on in the present and uh, current uh, NDC. We are also publishing some country case studies, trying to, to highlight what the country are doing. So here you have uh, some examples, the first one published from Zimbabwe, um, trying to also work on the uh, education aspect on uh, supporting uh, farmers and uh, also school or university to understand uh, what is at stake. On Morocco, it was an uh, agroforestry system that is argan tree, argan, uh, argan culture, at, uh, a tree based on argan producing oil. On Mongolia, it was on uh, livestock. And the last one was uh, on Uruguay, and this will be the end of the presentation. We will have more detail on what we're doing also in Uruguay. So before handling the floor to, to, to my colleague, uh, here what we are doing in terms of country support. So you have uh, five uh, example here. So we are part of the CAP uh, process. NDC Partnership Climate Action Enhancement Package uh, was uh, presented at the beginning. So FAO, we will support uh, 19 countries uh, through the Technical Assistance Fund plus our own re resources. Uh, we are uh, cooperating at regional level, for instance, here in Africa with the uh, African Union. So we have a regional uh, technical uh, cooperation uh, program. 
uh, trying to develop uh, tool, normative tool, also support uh, methodological tools, how to increase and, and the ambition and the NDC of Africa. We are supporting country to access, in, uh, so in terms uh, um, um, to understand and to improve the transparency aspect. Walter was mentioning a lot on MRV system, so MRV are part of the transparency system. So transparency in reporting in terms of action, but also in terms of uh, financing. So this is all a part of a fund uh, managed under the, the GEF, uh, CBIT, was decided as a COP decision uh, in, uh, in Paris COP, COP 15. And we are at FAO, so we are supporting several countries uh, to have a national uh, CBIT project on both mitigation or adaptation or focusing from one of the, of the two. And we have also a global CBIT on uh, specifically on agriculture, uh, CBIT, AFOLU. And we have also colleagues that have uh, on the one supporting on, uh, on forestry, for, for instance. Um, two last uh, point uh, on uh, the bottom uh, right of your uh, screen. So CCAC, one of the organizers of that uh, webinar, we are FAO is part of uh, the agriculture initiative uh, of that. So you have seen uh, an example previously. On the, the biggest uh, square here on my screen, this is a uh, Scala. So this is a really a new project we are uh, trying to shape with our partner uh, with from uh, UNDP, funded by, by BMU from Ministry of uh, uh, Environment of uh, Germany. So it will be re really to focus on uh, on increasing the ambition on uh, on the NDC in the agriculture sector and also on the uh, adaptation uh, plan. No. I will hand over to Cecilia. Cecilia, please. I will try to. Hello. Yes. Um, so I, I'll. I know it's it's the end of this webinar, and people might be tired. I'm just gonna have a couple of specific examples of support in MDC enhancement in Uruguay. Um, so Walter already mentioned the kind of uh, NDC that Uruguay has. And um, we have specific goals and within our NDC, we have specific goals for sector and the LLUCDF uh, sector is, is very important. We commit as Walter said to the reduction in intensity of emissions in, in meat production, reduction in emissions in dairy, um, nutrient management and, and croplands and increase and maintain carbon sequestration in forests and soils. And um, in 2019, the country developed um, a public open MR, MRB system to help track progress and provide transparency to the, our NDC. Currently, Uruguay is receiving support from FAO through the NAPAC program to strengthen this R MRB system and make progress on the development of baseline for our indicators and developing indicators from, from some of our targets. Uh, currently, we are uh, developing a, a survey to assess um, what are the management practices that are being applied in the field and have an adequate in, in territory baseline for our targets. So that's one way where we're receiving support to strengthen our MRB system and, and enhance our NDC. Another example of how Uruguay has received support from uh, FAO and, and also UNDP, it's a, it's a joint program uh, funded by the Ministry of, uh, of Environment of Germany, is the development of our national uh, adaptation plan for agriculture. Uh, Uruguay was part of this NAP Act global program and, and that went from 2016 to 2019. In September of 2019 was when the NAP Act was launched. And the NAP Act is in itself one of the targets of our NDC. Improving adaptation in agriculture sector is, is crucial for the economy of the country, but also to achieve the goals set up on the NDC. This uh, national adaptation plan has a 2025 action plan that identify 66 actions to support adaptation and that also contribute to mitigation efforts. The monitor and evaluation uh, matrix of the NAPAG 
it has uh, is overlapping with the MRV of the MDC. And through the process, we make a, a specific effort of making sure that the adaptation contributes to mitigation and that the measurements that we take of the NAPAC process also contribute to the, to the MDC and to the sustainable development goals that the country is also committed. Um, these are, are just two examples. We, I, I invite you to, to visit the National Adaptation Plan document uh, we were and, and see how we assess vulnerability and, and how we approach this landscape um, effort that Walter mentioned and how we highlight the, the synergies between adaptation and mitigation to variability and climate change in the agricultural sector in Uruguay. You will receive this presentation here. You have the, the, uh, a way to, to consult this document. So we want to thank also the support from FAO, UNDP, and the German Federal Ministry of Environment uh, for the support that they gave to the National Adaptation Plan and the development of the MRV for the MDC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecilia and Marshall. Um, and I just wanted to thank all the panelists for their presentations today. Unfortunately, we won't have time for a live Q&A discussion, but uh, the panelists have done a fantastic job of responding to questions in the Q&A box. Um, so very much thanks to Catalina, to Laurel, to Hang An, to Walter, to Marshall and Cecilia. Um, it's fantastic. I would also like to thank our participants for joining today. We had about 200 people joining for most of the call, so it just shows the significant interest in the topic. Um, I'd like to thank our co-hosts at Oxfam and UNDP, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and the NDC Partnership. It's always wonderful to partner with you. And a, a special thanks to my colleagues, Beth Elliott and Mary Levine for helping this webinar run so smoothly today and, and all the promotion and the lead up. Um, as we've mentioned, a, a recording of today's webinar will be made available online after this event. Uh, you can find it at wri.org forward slash step up 2020. Um, we're also going to be hosting another webinar next week focused on forest and the land sector and the NDC. So please do join us then and, and register using the link um, provided. And um, I also wanted to flag that if you're interested in learning more about at the agriculture sector, the emissions from countries, the type of commitments that countries have made in their first round of NDCs, there's a lot of information related to this on the Climate Watch platform. Um, it's displayed right now and uh, you can find it at the link provided as well. Um, so with that, we're going to conclude today's webinar. Um, keep well, everyone, and take care. Goodbye. <laughs>